is quite spurious, but actually I can relate to that completely in that a member of my family has been having a treatment recently and we've had to take them out of school and they've had to miss stuff because of that treatment. And actually, when I we go to the appointments, 70% of them are a complete waste of time. And as a result, they've missed out on important bits of education at a time when they can't afford to. So that's a direct example that, that relates to what you were talking about. Yeah, but it's kind of that we talk about, it's called that butterfly effect. Epidemiologists talk about a butterfly flaps its wings and it affects the world. But yeah, that was the whole idea that um, screening for a disease, it was actually with newborns, but it required, if it was a positive test, it required a uh, procedure done by a cardiologist. In the U.S., there's a lot of small community hospitals where babies are born, but they don't have a cardiologist right there. So this particular case was where the family had to drive from one place in Virginia to a nearby town in Tennessee. And, you know, there was a car accident and the whole family was killed. And it was this idea that when we look at an intervention, we really have to look at the, the total effect of that intervention and not just on the disease, but really what effect it has on everything. And I remember having a discussion with the cardiologist and he got really upset. He says, it's not my fault that they got in a car accident. And I was like, yeah, but if we weren't doing that screening test, they wouldn't have been on the road in the first place. So we really have to look at the whole thing. (laughs) Well, Dave, um, you may not have heard previous episodes, but I'm not always kind to some cardiologists in the fact that they are the classic single organologist and they don't really look any further than the beating heart. You know, this one was a little really tough for him. One of the interesting studies you guys probably remember, the New England Journal of Medicine, the first study that looked at tight control of diabetes with type 1 diabetics was published in like 1993, but they looked at mortality in the group that had tight control and some of the mortalities that they reported were individuals who were walking on the sidewalk who were killed by people who were in the study that had low blood sugar and drove off the road and killed them as they were walking on the sidewalk. And they reported that as mortalities associated with tight control. We said, then that's great. That's real honest and reporting of that intervention. So that was just part of it is we need to really look and do stuff like that. The bit I loved most was the unintended harm number five, which you call out of Oz and back to canvas. And for the listener, I should just explain that what you're saying is that as in the Wizard of Oz where Dorothy is transported to a magical world far different from her own the point that you talk about the sprint study and the again I'm sorry cardiologists if you're listening but going back to the sprint study and about how you know surely lower is better um, and actually what you're pointing out is that you know there's a clinical trial patient and there's a real world patient and actually in a study like that where you are properly sat down for 10 or 20 minutes and you've done it three times with so many minutes in between whereas in reality in the office or in the GP practice that isn't what's happened and that therefore the the level of blood pressure that I might get today when I do it in the practice is could well be similar if I'd done it in the study way and so I've always been attracted to those sorts of things and use a, a slide set often with what I call a clinical trial patient which is a beautiful lady in a bed with everyone around her who's also beautiful and then a, a very old very frail man you know in a bed with an oxygen mask on and there's a real difference isn't there between a clinical trial patient and a real patient absolutely yeah no the the sprint one is such a mess I mean I, I fight that battle here all the time that clinicians are way over treating their patients you know Jamie we talked about this especially elderly patients and the harm that goes with that and you know they do hear Steve what you just said that there's no J curve. The lower you go, the better it is. And there's just tons of evidence that disagrees with that. And the method of measuring, as you talked about, nobody in the real world takes the amount of time that it means every adult patient that I see, somebody has to put them in the room for 15 minutes alone before I even go in and see them to get their blood pressure checked three times with a blood cuff that does it automatically. It it just doesn't happen. Um, And yet people make decisions based on those those results and it it is it's very harmful to the patient so we'll put the reference in the show notes but just for the listeners look there's five unintended harms that we've talked about or that dave and alan have talked about rather activism gone awry innocent bystanders the worried well we create the butterfly effect and then the one that steve just mentioned then out of oz and back to kansas you know it's been published a few months ago dave any um, comeback or any correspondence on the back of it yeah it's funny that you asked that jamie that's the struggle of my life no we haven't heard much of a from it. You wait till the listeners of the Oral Apothecary yeah. podcast get behind this, Dave, okay? That post bag will be full. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have an extra question, actually. I was talking to Lawrence Brad, who's a GP I work with very closely, and he was on Series 1, Episode 3. And I told him that we were going to be talking about this paper. And he immediately said to me, oh, do ask Dave, because I told him you were like a GP in, in America. And he said, do you have like here where we've got GPs, we've got clinical pharmacists who can prescribe, we've got advanced nurse practitioners that can prescribe, we've got paramedics that can prescribe. And so 
while he absolutely values all the things that we bring, he finds that it sometimes makes those conversations a lot more difficult because he may have taken one stance and then if somebody hasn't read or understood, you know, his stance with the patient, they can almost unlock all the work. And not just him, he's saying it could happen for any of us and then we'd all not follow what the last person had said. Any comment about that? Yes, yeah, Steve, you hit the nail on the head or your friend did. Yeah, that's a big problem here too. One of the things that we've found is that just doing information mastery workshops and training interested people to think this way is nowhere near enough. What it's really going to require is, I would say it's going to require a culture change where an entire institution says, we're going to do whatever it takes to minimize low-valued care, to save resources that are wasted, and everybody's going to get the same training. Because if you do just have some of it, it's going to get derailed exactly as you talked about, Steve. That's a genuine problem that's going to need a different solution than the one that we've done so far. A bit like a patient safety initiative almost, like the hospital in Boston, isn't it? Where everybody's really signed up to it from the medical director downwards. Yeah, one of my colleagues said, let's take your course and we'll teach it to all of our residents. And I said, don't even bother unless you're going to get the entire institution to do it because they're just going to go out and be scoffed at and it'll cause to some extent more frustration. But we're still waiting for um, someplace somewhere to really say we're going to do it with the whole group. Thanks all. A big thank you to Dave for joining us on the Oral Apothecary and for sharing his Desert Island Drug, a career anthem and his book. Coming up next time, our final episode of Series 2, Can you believe it? We will be joined by Dr. Mark Holland. Mark is Associate Professor at the University of Bolton and former President of the Society for Acute Medicine. We will look forward to welcoming Mark next time on the Oral Apothecary. Over to Gimmo now for our contact details and the final ingredient. A big thanks to me, Dave. Great to see you again and thanks for all the influence you've had on my career. It was was great speaking to you. You can get contacts on Twitter at Oral Apothecary or you can email us at oralapothecarypod at gmail.com. Social media shout out. Remember in episode 10 of series one, we talked to, I think it was Parman UK. They were the people who'd made the remote medicines management service. Well, they've been shortlisted for HSJ Patient Safety Award. Good luck to those guys. And hello to um, Kathy Cook, Karen Harring, and others who are listening to the podcast while they're doing their ironing. We think we've mentioned this before, but it seems that we've become the podcast of choice to do housework too. So if anyone else is doing housework while they listen to us, then please let us know. So I wanted to finish with the final ingredient of what I started with about sustainable medicines use. And Dr. Mark Porter mentioned a few weeks ago that one of the issues that was taxing him was, was around carbon reduction and, and looking at inhalers. According to an article in the PGA, what are the two biggest green interventions that have happened in the NHS in the last year, do you think? Well, the first one is a drop in the NHS use of something called, and I may pronounce this wrong, Steve, apologies, desflurane gas in anaesthesia. Is that right? Desflurane. Desflurane. Yep, um, in anaesthesia. So by switching that to a lower carbon alternative, that's actually cut CO2 emissions equal to 200 million miles by car journeys within the last year. And the second is actually as a result of COVID and is down to the increase in virtual appointments. So less people using their cars, I suppose, to go to their GPs, I guess. And that's a saving of 75 kilotons of carbon dioxide emitted. So that may well come back, I guess. But I just thought it was interesting. We're all going to have to do more. The NHS have set out plans to become the world's first net zero NHS. We've seen our own funny weather over here. We've seen the extreme weather in Canada. You don't need me to tell you about it. But it's going to require massive changes, perhaps on an even larger scale than we've seen during covid so there you have it that's my final ingredient if we don't act on sustainability soon then this might really be the final ingredient this was a three apothecaries production sound engineer jimbo slough original music jamie brewster artwork by david baker thanks for listening to the oral apothecary podcast do not stop listening except on your doctor's advice this episode of the oral apothecary is sponsored by jamiehayes.co.uk. Mm-hmm.